In 1963, Sega released their very first arcade game. It was just one of those punching bag games. They've then followed this up with many more arcade games, like Rifleman and Sonar. But in 1973, they would make their first digitized arcade cabinet, Pongtron. But their first big hit was Monaco GP, which they ported to the Sega SG-1000. Then it was technically the first game in the Sonic the Hedgehog series, Flicky. The main character of that game being included in the original Sonic the Hedgehog as one of the animals you free from the badniks and the animal captures at the ends of the zones. Another hit, though more of a hit than Monaco GP and Flicky, was Space Harrier. The game also got re-released in the Sega Ages series on PlayStation 2, Sega Ages being the name of a series of re-releases of Sega games on Sega Saturn some home console games, but mostly arcade games. The first volume was a re-release of Puzzle and Action, Attent R. Then there was Volume 2, Space Harrier, Volume 3, Outrun, Volume 4, Afterburner 2, so on. Sega Ages series continued on PlayStation 2, the Sega Ages 2500 series. Volume 1 of the Sega Ages 2500 series has Fantasy Zone, Volume 2 had Monaco GP, so on. Some of the games re-released in the Sega Ages series actually got re-released again in the Sega Ages 2500 series. Some of them have more value due to having extra games packed in with them. A game that fits into both of those categories just happens to be in the first volume you released in the original Sega Saturn Sega Ages series, Puzzle and Action Tent R, a spin-off of Bonanza Bros, being re-released yet again in volume 6 of the Sega Ages 2500 series, released on August 28. 2003 in Japan, and the volume contains two games. The main game is obviously the aforementioned Puzzle and Action Tent R, but the other game just happens to be one of the best yet least talked about games I've ever played, Bonanza Bros. It was one of the earliest games built on the 24th iteration of the Sake System series of arcade boards and has been ported to different systems a shockingly high amount of times. The company US Gold ported the game to various different home computers from the time. Computers in question being the Amstrad CPC, the Atari ST, the Commodore 64, the Amiga, the, the PC Engine otherwise known as the Turbo Graphic CD, the Sharp X68000 and the ZX Spectrum. Sega themselves made the rest of the ports to other platforms. The most accessible version is the Genesis version, which was ported to the Sega Mega Drive Classics collection on Steam for Windows, Linux, and Mac OS, as well as Nintendo Switch, PlayStation 4, and Xbox One on the 1st of June 2010. It released on Xbox 360, Xbox Series S and X, PlayStation 3, 5, and PlayStation Portable. Sonic Gems collection for the Nintendo GameCube and PlayStation 2 also included Bonanza Bros, though only in the Japanese version. The Master System also got a port, which is easily the most different. I've already mentioned Puzzle and Action 10R, but there's also been two more games in the Puzzle and Action series, Puzzle and Action Itch 10R and Puzzle and Action Treasure Hunt. I'm playing on the Genesis version, not the arcade one, because as I said, it's the most accessible version. But I will look at the Master System version later in the video. But enough talking, let me tell you about the game itself. Nance Bros, by itself, doesn't look like much. It's a simple side-scrolling action stealth-like game with the caveat that there's two lanes you can switch between on the fly in the right circumstances. But the more you play, the more you realise just how fun this game can get. It's got just the right amount of speed, precision and engaging gameplay to make it one of the best games on the Mega Drive right next to Sonic 2 and 3 as well as Ristar. And it's got a high skill ceiling to boot. The only complaint I have is the length of the game. There's only 10 levels and after that, you're at the credits. So there isn't really much here and I'm left just wanting more. But I guess that's a good and bad thing. Good because well, the game is solid enough that I want more, but bad because well, I didn't get any more. 10 levels, 6 music tracks, 5 enemies, a loose plot, sounds pretty lame right? Well it doesn't matter how much there is, it's how you use it. There's some cool techniques and strategies you can put to use if you're good enough at the game. For example, if you're standing still or you're moving and you shoot, you stomp for a second, but if you're in the air while doing it, you don't. This is a pretty niche technique all things considered, as the starting jump itself has a delay. The only way you can put this to use is if there's two enemies you need to knock out. 
There's also lane swapping. If you have guards chasing you, you can swap lanes. So the guards have to swap lanes too, giving you a bit more time. And this game may be a stealth game, but jumping is absolutely broken in this. And you can jump over enemies if they're not alerted. This is especially useful against shield guards, because like right here, I jump over to get behind him in the shield, and now I can shoot him, because there's no shield in the way. We start at level 1, Company. A pretty basic stage with only two floors and an exceptionally generic rectangular shape. There's three enemy classes here. There's the blue guard, an enemy that, when alerted, alerts surrounding enemies and then bullets towards you. There's the light blue guard, a guard that will shoot you and if detecting a wall between you and it, will hide behind a wall. And shield guard, which has a shield that blocks projectiles coming from the front. It also has two behaviours, one that simply shoots at you and well, well, like the blue guard, alert nearby enemies and chase you down, only more slowly. Millionaire's Mansion, the second map. Here you get introduced to the green guard, similar to the blue guard but wielding a gun, and the purple guard, who takes four hits and throws bombs at the expense of fire rate. The casino doesn't have much interesting going on other than being the first and the only level to use springs. But Mint is a different story. The enemies in this level are almost exclusively purple and especially shield guards. They're everywhere, but fear not as you have a weapon on your side, the Crusher. Flip the switch and the Crusher comes crashing down, flattening anyone in your path. Oh, and though I did say the enemies are almost exclusively purple and shield guards, this is the introduction of the dark enemy. Underground gold bars begins with a real intro, showing you riding a minecart and crashing into the end of the rails, which stuns you as if you crash through a wall using a zipline. Julie's Storm may be the most forgettable lever here, but it ain't bad. It's got two cans at the start, or I guess a cat in a hat, and it's got three floors. Just sort of uninspired. Same with Laboratory, like, it's neat, and it's one of the harder maps, but there's nothing to mention here. The Lux Liner reels it back in though, as is my personal favorite map of the game, right next to the next map we have. It's got a pretty complex layout, it looks nice, it's challenging but not frustrating, just a great map all around. And then we've got Art Gallery, my second favorite map. This is the only other map with a zip line, and it's genuinely a hard map. It's got lots of enemies and you'd be hard pressed to find an area where it's not a challenge to escape guards without being hit yourself. Then there's Pyramid, which is really hard. It's a weird difficulty spike. See, like most old games, there's a time limit on each level, that limit being 3 minutes. And this is generally never a problem unless if you're really bad at this game. This is the exception. You can play this level flawlessly and you'll still only have around 35 seconds left. And if you're not good enough to do that, you're gonna game over here quite a bit. Overall, the levels in this game are mostly hits. There's only two real misses, that of course being jewelry store and laboratory, but the majority are fun to play, which is the only thing that really matters. One more thing to mention, the music. And there's only six songs for the game, but the songs that I hear are godly. Songs for Company and Mint in particular are my favourites, as well as the credits theme, which is right up there with Mario Kart DS as one of my favourite credits themes. Take a listen. They're very arcade-like, which makes sense as it literally is an arcade game, even if it was ported to other systems. Like the Sega Master System. Remember how I mentioned in the history of the game that the game was most different on the Master System? Let's take a look at that. The 
Sega Mark III, aka the Sega Master System, received many official remakes of Sega Genesis games. Sonic 1, Sonic 2, Sonic Spinball, and Dr. Robotics' Mean Bee Machine received remakes. Even Earthworm Jim got a remake. And of course, Robo and Mobo get their time to shine on the Master System. Only they got a name change. Meet Mike and Spike. I never really knew why they changed it. Robo and Mobo are way better names. Either way, this game is damn hard. When an enemy see you, there's no delay between looking at you and dashing towards you, which is very unlike the superior Sega Genesis version. The level designs are different and often more unfair. Bullets have limited range, you walk super slowly, there's no map at the top of the screen, enemies can stay in place and block you, you get stunned if you drop down the stairs, lane swapping is harder to pull off due to enemies swapping lanes faster. There is nothing about this game that is easy. Hell, I could beat Bonanza Bros with relative ease. I didn't even make it past level 8 here. Okay, I should, um, I should calm down and just talk about the game. The game functions relatively similar to the Genesis version, and there's not really any major changes here other than the removal of two player, but it's more like a bunch of little things that add up to make this a much different experience. For example, walking. You walk slower here than you do in the Genesis version. The enemy types are different colours, in fact the purple guide isn't even present at all in this version. There's this little mini floor in the staircases for no apparent reason, but it's nice I suppose. The blimp doesn't pick you up at the end of a level, there's bonus games, there's levels that aren't even present in the Genesis version. I think you get the idea. This is sort of a Bonanza Bros 0.5. Interestingly, the story differs from the Genesis version too. The Genesis version has Robo and Mobo going into buildings to get items to test security forces for a mysterious man on the TV. But the Master System version has the same mysterious man on the TV hiring Mike and Spike to get evidence from joints that are run by counterfeiters and cheating casino operators so they can clean Badville of all the corrupt people. That's a way better story. I mean, I don't care because I don't read the stories, but still. That obviously doesn't ruin the Genesis version and it's still as fun as ever. I just thought I'd mention it. I figured since I've covered the Master System port, I might as well cover two more of the ports. The Amiga, manufactured by Commodore International, is such a weird console. There's just a weird feeling these old computers give off, like the Atari ST and especially the ZX Spectrum. And of course, Bonanza Bros got a port to it too. This looks promising. Now, a little bit of context here, I have absolutely no experience emulating these old computers. So when I first played this, the controls were really weird. It was the usual W, A, S, and D setup, but instead of down being S, it was X, which is right below, so sort of like a D-pad. But the fire button, aka shoot and jump, was mapped to S, so it's essentially just a one-handed game. I eventually just figured it out and set it to my usual button layout, but for the time being it was held to play. But anyway, remember how like 5 seconds ago I said the fire button, which is basically like an A button on the Amiga, is both jump and shoot? Yeah, well, uh, jumping is quite the pain in this game. Basically, pressing fire will shoot as you'd expect, but hold it for a second longer and you'll jump. It's a bit weird, and it definitely is a flaw, but I can live with it. But this game, it just feels so wrong. Especially the oddly smooth screen scrolling. I think why it feels so wrong is that, as you can see, it takes the sprites straight from the Genesis version. So my brain automatically assumes that this is like the Genesis version. So that's why every time something odd happens, my brain just doesn't like it. And even the sprites themselves are weird. It's like color swaps to otherwise identical graphics. And the music is just... It's, listen. I don't know, I thought this would be a fun game, but eh. Guess I can't expect too much from a computer released in 1985. But the Amiga port wasn't the only Bonanza Bros port on a Commodore system. This doesn't look very promising. The 
The Commodore 64 port of Bonanza Bros follows in the footsteps of the Amiga port in a few ways, like the enemy variety and the controls. So yes, like the Amiga port, jumping and shooting are mapped to the same button. The main problem with this port is that there's a severe lack of polish to everything. It feels like a prototype build, and that's not even an exaggeration. When you grab items, there's no animation. You can walk in the air, the bullet sprite doesn't have a transparent background, there's no hit stun, there's tons of flashing in between levels because I presume the Commodore is trying to load the next level, so on. In fact, this game may actually be a prototype. It might not have been finished before being released. I couldn't find anything online relating to the topic, obviously, but I genuinely think so. Remember how it, when I was covering the Amiga port, I mentioned the weird vibe these old computers give off? This is an example of that. This game is weird. Quite weird. Hell, Mint, one of my favorite stages from the game, now looks like a garage. And you collect hearts instead of the usual treasures? Honestly, I don't have much to say about this game other than it's unfinished. It's just bad. I just kind of wanted an excuse to talk about the Commodore 64 for a bit, since I kind of like this thing. Bonanza Bros is one of my favourite games of all time. I think what annoys me the most about the game is that it never got a sequel or anything, only three spin-off puzzle games. At lame. But I'll tell you this, this was a real fun video to make. This has been the Warrior Enthusiast, and I hope you have a lovely day.